We're here today uh, to talk about something that's near and dear to my heart, not just because I married a radiologist, but because I do firmly believe that emergency imaging is a critical part of our job as emergency providers. It's something I'm really passionate about, and I've actually spent a good portion of my career uh, studying and teaching it. Um, we actually, I do a course, a required course for our residents in emergency radiology um, because I feel that strongly in it. And we're going to start today talking about chest x-rays, which makes sense because that really is sort of the workhorse of the radiology world and something it seems like no matter what anyone comes to the emergency department, we figure out a way to get a chest x-ray on them for something. So we'll start with that. I'm very excited. We have a brand new clicker today that lets me zoom in on things. So for the radiology geek of me, this is really awesome, so bear with me. Uh, so I get asked this all the time, why do we care about x-rays? It seems like everyone's getting a CAT scan. And yes, undeniably, CAT scan is a better diagnostic test. But when you look at the numbers, plain radiography still holds the lion's share of imaging in the department. It's roughly two thirds of all imaging studies are plain radiographs. And of those, chest x-rays represent the most common. And more critically, there's a lot of valuable real estate in the chest, if you think about it. And when something goes wrong there, a lot of the interventions that we have to do are fairly invasive. And you may be the one that has to make that call. Depending on where you practice, you may not have a radiologist right down the hall at your beck and call to interpret for you. They may be in India or Australia, and it may take two hours to get a read back. And quite frankly, they're not always right either. So it's up to us to own this. Like Rick said, we're ordering the studies. We should be interpreting it. So our goals for today are pretty simple. We're going to talk about a systematic way of interpreting chest radiographs. My residents hear this all the time. You've got to be systematic, and you've got to do it the same way every time. And that way, you don't make mistakes. I'm going to talk about some of the common abnormal findings and disease processes that we see. And along the way, I want to touch on some of the pitfalls that I see people falling into not infrequently. And by the way, all these cases are from my own institution. Most of these were either my own mistakes or mistakes that my colleagues have made. So I'm up here airing my dirty laundry for you guys to benefit from. So show of hands, who here still remembers actual plain films? All right, that makes me feel better that I'm not too, too old. Um, but this is what my residents look like when somebody gets transferred in from an outside uh, urgent care with like an actual plain film. They have no idea what to do with it. I don't even know if we have a hot like a viewing station in the ED anymore. I like to call chest x-rays the medical Rorschach drawing because it's, even though it's a black and white study, I like to sh say it's all shades of gray. It really is uh, up to our interpretation. And you, know, you hold it up and then be like, yeah, maybe they look a little bit wet, or yeah, maybe I see a hint of a pneumonia. You know, really, it takes, it's whatever it takes to get grandma admitted to the hospitalist. You know what I mean? We can sort of swing that any way that we want. But the history and physical really do come down, are very important in how we interpret these uh, images. So again, even though it's black and white, there really are shades of gray. And the advantage that we have as emergency providers is that we have the patient in front of us. We know what they're presenting with, we have their exam, we have their history. Whereas the radiologists are really at a disadvantage. They literally are in a black box reading these films. And many different pathophysiologies have a very similar appearance on x-ray. So we're going to spend some time talking about the different diseases that you will see and how uh, the history and physical can really sort of play into it. Again, you need to be systematic. So first things first, when we're looking at a chest x-ray, and I know this sounds a little uh, sort of silly, but when you start looking at a radiograph, the first thing you want to do is look at the markers. You want to see, is it the right patient, and is it the right study? And the reason why I say that, in particular for chest x-rays, is because we tend to get serial chest x-rays in someone who's sick. So somebody comes in, they're short of breath, we get an x-ray. We intubate them, we get an x-ray. Suddenly they decompensate, we get another x-ray. And so you can very quickly sort of rack up multiple x-rays on the same patient. And it's very, very easy, and I've done it myself with electronic digital imaging to pull up the wrong study. So before you make any sort of decisions, just make sure that it's the right study that you're looking at. The second thing is you want to look at the um, positioning markers and make sure that left is really left. A few years ago, our imaging software had a glitch in it where it started flipping images, and somebody almost got a wrong sided chest tube because of it. So as part of your initial assessment, just make sure that left is really left. And then the third thing, and something, if you take nothing else out of my talks, um, I think this is probably one of the most critical things, and that is evaluating the film technique. And what I mean by that is, what position was the patient in when they took the film? 
Were they upright or supine? Is it an AP or a PA film? Because those sort of things have, can have a drastic uh, impact on how we interpret the films. And I'm going to show you some examples as we go along where that really, really matters. The next thing you want to do as you're starting to assess the film is look for adequacy. And there are four big things that go into adequacy. Basically, penetration, inspiration, rotation, and completeness. And by completeness, everything you need to see needs to be on the film. So when we're assessing for penetration, what you want to do is you should be able to see the lower thoracic vertebrae through the heart. And if you look down here, you're able to make out those vertebrae, not in great detail like you would with a T-spine film, because that would mean the film is probably overexposed for the chest, but you should be able to make out the outlines of it. I don't think a lot of people realize that when the x-ray techs take the film, it's not just a single button that they push. It's not a one-size-fits-all solution. They actually have to look at the patient, look at their body habitus, and they dial up or down the juice to match it. And so there are times when the penetration may be off. The next thing is we usually take chest x-rays in full inspiration. And we do that so the lungs are fully inflated and we're able to really adequately visualize everything. And the way that we assess for that is we count the ribs. And on the right, where the heart meets the diaphragm, we call it the cardiophrenic sulcus, should be the 10th or 11th rib. If you're not fully inspired, what it does is it, the lungs get squished down, it makes the heart and mediastinum look bigger than they are, and it makes the lungs look very congested when actually they're not. So full inspiration. The next thing we look at is rotation. We want to make sure that the patient is centered on the film. And the way that we do that is we don't look at soft tissue structures like the trachea because they're mobile and things can shift them around. We look at the bony landmarks. And in particular, we look at the clavicular heads, which are there. And then we look at the tip of the spinous process, and it should be right in between that space. It's really important that you look for this, particularly on a supine film where it's more likely to be rotated. Because if it's a rotated film, it's going to have two effects. The first is that it's going to splay out the mediastinum and make it look wider than it is. The second effect, if you think about it, is that the second one of the lungs is going to be in closer contact to the cassette than the other, and therefore it's going to expose differently. One lung is going to be hazier than the other. In a supine patient, a hemothorax or a pleural effusion layers this way, and what it can look like radiographically is just a hazier lung. So in a trauma situation like this patient, if the film is rotated, if I were to look at this, I'd be worried that that left side might have a hemothorax on it because it's hazier than the other. When in reality, it's all technique. It's because the patient's rotated. All right, so again, positioning can have a big impact on how we interpret things. And then completeness. You need to be able to see everything on the film. You need to be able to fully see the costophrenic angles. You also need to keep in mind that when we order a chest x-ray series, it really is a PA and a lateral to be complete. And we hide a lot of things on the lateral. There's a lot of space back there where things can hide out, things like pleural effusions, pneumonias, masses. Sternal fractures only show up on the lateral. So again, keep in mind, if you really want to complete x-ray series, you really should be getting a PA and a lateral. All right. So how do we actually read these? If you look in textbooks, there's different approaches that people talk about. So there's the geographic approach, where you either start at the outside and work your way in, or vice versa. The problem with that is, unless you're incredibly well-trained and diligent, people, when they see something, they tend to stop, and they miss everything else that's on the film. That's sort of human nature. So I'm not a big fan of the geographic approach. The second approach that people use, and I think a lot of people in emergency medicine use, is the targeted approach. For instance, somebody comes in with a fever and a cough. You get an x-ray looking for the pneumonia, and you move on. Again, the problem with that is, you're only looking at one specific part of the film, and there's a lot of other things that could be going on there. My favorite approach, and the one that I teach the residents, is the ABCs. And I like the ABCs, because I'm going to show you in a minute, it makes you look at the lungs last. So this is a great, what I call a happy eyes case. This is my own case. It was a 21-year-old gentleman, very unfortunate. He had severe MR, uh, cerebral palsy. He was a spastic quadriplegic, nonverbal. He had a seizure disorder, and he came in because he was having repeated seizures. And he had one in front of us. He vomited and aspirated, and like you could hear the chunks going down. It was just right in front of us, nothing we could do. And subsequently, he was hypoxic and tachypnic and really working. So we got the x-ray, and sure enough, it showed this big, dense consolidation, just like we thought it would. 
And so I admitted him for his ongoing hypoxia and work of breathing. And the mother kept coming out of the room, and she's like, something's not right with my son. I know him well. Something is just not right. And I sort of patted her on the head, and I was like, yeah, well, he's got this pneumonia. You know, he vomited and aspirated and blah, blah, blah. Go back in your room. And it wasn't until about two hours later when the radiologist actually came out of the booth. And you know that that is never a good sign when they come stumbling out into the bright light, right? Like something bad is going on. And he came up to me, and he's like, Bob, what's, what's going on with this guy? And I said, what do you mean, Brad? And he's got a pneumonia. He aspirated. He's like, yeah, I haven't seen any post-reductions come by my desk. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And sure enough, when you look, his shoulder's out from his seizure. So I let this poor nonverbal kid sit there with his shoulder hanging out for hours because I got happy eyes. I expected to see the pneumonia. I saw the pneumonia, and I moved on. And I forgot to look at the whole picture. So what I would encourage you guys is, as you start to approach your chest x-rays, is use the ABCs. Airway, bones, cardiomediastinum, diaphragm, everything, use for everything else. And that means things like lines, tubes, foreign bodies, air under the diaphragm, air elsewhere where it doesn't belong. And then finally, F is for fields or lung fields. And if, I really, really encourage you guys to try and train yourself, do it this way every time, and look at the lungs last. Now, sure, if somebody comes in, they're in respiratory distress, they're you know, super hypoxic, looking like they're about to code, Fine, look at the lungs. Make sure they don't have a huge pneumothorax or something like that, but at least make sure you go back and do the system, and you will save yourself and your patients a lot of grief. All right, so now that we know how to read them, let's look at some cases. I love cases, and again, these are all real-life cases from my institution. So this guy comes in. He's a 42-year-old gentleman. He comes in with a fever and a cough. And for the sake of time, I want to run through a bunch of cases, so we're not going to go fully go through all the ABCs on all of these, but when we look at this guy, as we get to our lung fields, we see he has this big, dense consolidation down here at the base. Uh, there we are. And so you notice I say consolidation and not infiltrate. I'm trying to be a real stickler here. We use that term very sloppily. When we say infiltrate, what it really means is infiltration of inflammatory cells into that area. So that's a histopathologic diagnosis. We don't know that for sure. And so the radiographic term is a consolidation or an opacity. All right, and we're describing what we're seeing. So what I'm seeing is an opacity on the right. And with his history, fever and a cough, pretty consistent with a pneumonia. So then the next question is, where is it? And as we look, as we do our ABCs, we look at the cardiomediastinum. And what I'm noticing is I'm not seeing the right heart border at all. It's obscured by this consolidation. Now, I like to say that x-rays are a study in contrast. In order for you to see a border on x-ray, you need something of one density against something of a different density. So normally, we have dense heart and aerated lung sitting next to each other, and you see a nicely defined heart border. Now what we have is dense heart and pus-filled alveoli, like in a pneumonia, so dense and dense, and we lose that contrast, we lose that border. And in this case, I'm losing that right heart border, and I know anatomically that the right middle lobe sits up against the right heart border. And so this tells me that this is a right middle lobe consolidation. All right? This is what we refer to as one of the silhouette signs. And it's really a misnomer because it's the loss of silhouette. But it helps us localize lesions on plain film. So it can come in really handy. Some of the other silhouette signs, if you lose the right hemidiaphragm, we know the right lower lobe sits against the right hemidiaphragm. So if you lose the right hemidiaphragm, it's a right lower lobe lesion. If you lose the left upper heart border, we know that that's where the left lingulus sits. So that's a left lingular lesion. All right, so these are all silhouette signs that we use. Here's another guy, very similar story. A couple days, fever, cough. He's got some right-sided pleuritic pain. And sure enough, when we get the x-ray, it looks a lot like the one that we just saw. But when we take a closer look at it, you can actually trace out that right heart border pretty well, all the way down to the diaphragm. But when I trace over the, um, the right hemidiaphragm, I lose it medially near the heart. So this tells me this is most likely a right lower lobe process going on. He's tilted a little bit because he's splinting, because pneumonia hurts. It irritates the pleura. Um, if we take an even closer look at it, um, hopefully you guys can appreciate there's this Y-shaped, inverted Y-shaped structure here. And what that is, is a classic finding in pneumonia. That's known as an air bronchogram. You guys have probably heard that term before. 
And what an air bronchogram is, is normally you have air-filled bronchus surrounded by air-filled alveoli, so you don't see the bronchi very well. Now what we have is an air-filled bronchus surrounded by pus-filled alveoli, and that's pretty consistent with a pneumonia. All right, so this is a classic air bronchogram with a right lower lobe uh, pneumonia. All right, this woman comes in. I distinctly remember this woman. It was a very impressive presentation. Uh, she was a pretty morbidly obese 65-year-old woman, very sedentary, who came in with pretty rapid onset of left-sided pleuritic chest pain. She was tachypnic. She was tachycardic. She was hypoxic down to about 90%. She didn't have any known lung pathology or CHF. And she was really working. I, I distinctly remember this woman. So what does she have? She's tachycardic, tachypnic, hypoxic. She's sedentary. She has a PE, right? And so I got the x-ray. And honestly, I wasn't really expecting to see much because in my mind, I had already decided, you know, at least number one, two, and three on my differential was a PE. And as I'm looking at it, she looks a little hazy, but it was, it's more her body habitus that's giving that impression. And if you look, you're actually able to make out her lower thoracic vertebrae there. So I know that it's adequately penetrated, but I wasn't really seeing much else. Here's her lateral. And again, nothing super jumped out at me right away. And so then I looked at her priors, which I always encourage you guys to do. If you have access to priors, it can be really illuminating to go back and compare them. And when I look at her prior from a year ago, it looks different. And in particular, what's different is on her prior, I'm able to trace her left hemidiaphragm all the way over behind the heart. And today I can't, I lose it. And when I look at her lateral from a year ago, it also looks different. And again, what looks different is in that posterior space, um, as her spine goes down, it's becoming more loosened, it's getting darker. Whereas on today's film, it gets brighter. And what that tells me is that something is sitting behind the heart there in that retrocardiac space. Now, to my mind, initially, that was pretty subtle, and it didn't really seem to fit with her really impressive clinical presentation. So I scanned her, looking for a PE. And sure enough, she had a big socked-in pneumonia. All right, and so you can see, same patient, probably about a half an hour difference in between the films, just how subtle that plain film finding is and how real the pathology was. And so this is what we call the spine sign. So on the lateral, as you go down, it should get darker, not brighter. If it is getting brighter, you need to appreciate it for what it really represents, and that's typically a retrocardiac, either pneumonia or an effusion. All right, so again, very subtle plain film findings, very real pathology. All right, this woman comes in, 45-year-old woman. Uh, she was homeless. Uh, she came in with about two weeks of low-grade fever, cough, increasing work of breathing, and she looked pretty rough. She was hypoxic. She was working. And here's her x-ray. She had a tempo like 100.4, so pretty low-grade. And as I look at it, I'm able to trace out her heart borders. I don't see any big focal consolidation to suggest a, a, like a low-bar pneumonia. But her interstitium just looks wet. It looks too busy. There's too much going on in her interstitial tissues. And our helpful radiologist gives me this, you know, increased interstitial markings, differential includes pulmonary edema versus atypical inflammatory process. Great. You know, that's <laughs> super helpful. Um, I didn't think she had cardiogenic pulmonary edema. She had no history of that. But I was worried in this case with low grade fever, cough, infectious symptoms, could this be something like myocarditis? with subsequent heart failure and increased interstitial markings from that. Could be. Um, this ended up being PCP, or pneumocystis. Um, we did an HIV on her. She, her CD4 count was almost non-existent. They bronched her, and that's what this ended up being. And in retrospect, this is pretty classic for what pneumocystis pneumonia can look like. Originally, it was described as having this reticular or reticular nodular appearance. So reticular means lace-like or net-like. And that's that increased interstitial pattern. And then nodular, you can sometimes see sort of nodular opacities, and that's what this guy had. I saw him about a month later, almost the same exact clinical scenario, a couple of weeks, a little grade fever and cough. And on him, he has less of that interstitial pattern and more of kind of a fluffy nodular appearance to it. Now, the other big thing on my list, on my differential with this guy, with that appearance, was something like infective endocarditis with septic emboli. So we actually did end up scanning this guy looking for things like cavitary lesions, et cetera. But at the end of the day, this ended up also being PCP. All right, so it's going to have a fairly variable appearance. So when we're talking about pneumonia, 
We look for things like consolidations for low bar type pneumonias. We look for the silhouette signs to help us localize them. We look for and respect that spine sign. When you see it, it's real. And looking for things like air bronchograms. When we get into the atypical range, things like mycoplasma, viral pneumonias, uh, herpetic pneumonias, PCP, then we start to look at things like more like increased interstitial markings, which can look for all the world sometimes like cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And so again, that's where the clinical scenario starts to come into play. All right, this woman comes in, sudden onset, uh, shortness of breath, respiratory distress, and she's a mess. She comes in, she's hypoxic, she's tachypnic, she's really working, also fairly hypotensive. And as we look at it, a lot, some things start to jump out at me. She has cardiomegaly. Um, she obviously has some vascular disease. You see uh, these intimal calcifications in her aorta there. As we zoom in and take a closer look, as we look at her vessels in the upper lobes, they're big. They're really plump. This is an upright film. In, in an upright patient, gravity should be pulling that blood down. So the vessels in the upper lung fields should be smaller than the vessels in the lower lung fields, and here they're about the same. And what that's telling me is that there's increased um, back pressure. The blood is not making it through the heart, and everything is sort of backing up. And this is what we refer to as cephalization of the vessels. And this is a finding that's pretty consistent with cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Other things that we see, we th see a thickened edematous fissure, again, reflective of back pressures. There's fluid just backing up into the interstitium. Um, there's this perihydular fluffiness or fullness. As pulmonary edema progresses, everything starts to weep. And as it gets into the later stages, your pulmonary vasculature, your perihylar vasculature starts to get indistinct and sort of fluffy like this. If we take an even closer look at this, if we look out at the periphery, you see these linear lines um, based along the pleura there, like there and there. These are what are referred to as curly B lines. And what curly B lines are, are engorged interlobular septa. So again, increased back pressure filling up those interstitial tissues. And this is pretty specific, again, for cardiogenic pulmonary edema. All right, this guy comes in, respiratory distress. He was intubated pretty much on arrival. Um, we see his ET tube in place. He's also got the Band-Aids of Life on here, the pads. So somebody was worried about this guy, right? So he's pretty sick. And as we look at his x-ray, it's grossly abnormal. He's got a huge heart. He's supine, so we can't really comment on cephalization at that point because the pressure gradients are fairly equal now. But he does have very indistinct perihylar vasculature. He has a thickened interlobar fissure. Um, and if we look sort of closely down at the base, he's got curly B lines walking their way up. So this see, seems fairly consistent with cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Now, the radiologist could look at this and say, well, he's got these really dense sort of perihylar consolidations. Could this be multifocal pneumonia? Could be. He's got a lot of other findings that sort of lean us more towards CHF, but in the right clinical scenario, fever, cough, whatever, this could be pneumonia. And again, that's where the clinical scenario starts to play in a little bit. So when we're looking for things like cardiogenic pulmonary edema, we're looking at heart size, looking for cardiomegaly, keeping in mind that you can actually have acute heart failure with a normal heart size. There are things that can do that. Look for increased interstitial markings, look for effusions, look for those curly B lines. You will start to see them when you look for them. Look for cephalization on an upright film and then look for that perihylar crowding or fluffiness. All right, this guy comes in, 45-year-old male, kind of tall, thin guy, smoker, comes in with sudden onset sharp pleuritic chest and back pain. We get his x-ray, and as we sort of go through it, one of the things that sort of jumps out at me right away is the guy's fairly hyperinflated. He's got big lung fields, which sort of goes along with his smoking history. And then as we take a closer look, up at his right apex, he's having right side of chest pain, you'll see that he has a paucity of lung markings up in the apex. It's really sort of loosened up there. We're not seeing any interstitial markings at all. And then when you take an even closer look, you see this line there that doesn't really correspond to a rib or anything else. And that's actually his pleural reflection. That's his lung. So this is a pretty classic apical pneumothorax, sort of goes along with the clinical scenario. This one, as you look at it, it is pretty obvious. 
This one, also not so subtle. So uh, I practice in Rhode Island. We have a very prominent art school there, and some of the students sort of alternative lifestyles. So, um, but this young gentleman came in with, again, sudden onset, sharp pleuritic chest pain, and shortness of breath. And when you look on his left, there are like no lung markings. This is actually his entire left lung sitting right there. So this is a huge spontaneous pneumothorax. As you look, as, as you do your system and you look at the cardiomediastinum, it sort of jumps out at me that things are starting to get shifted over. So tension physiology is really a clinical diagnosis. All right, it depends on what the patient's hemodynamics are doing. But radiographically, this has sort of got my attention that he's showing radiographic signs of possible tension. Things are starting to get shifted over. The reason why I say it's a clinical diagnosis is this kid was sitting there on his cell phone texting and looking pretty good. All right? Young people can tolerate a lot before they sort of fall off the curve. So even though radiographically it looked like tension, this, uh, this uh, young man did not show physiologic signs of it yet. All right? So again, these are fairly obvious examples of pneumothoraces, but sometimes they're not so obvious. And so there are a few tips and tricks that you can use if you suspect it and you don't want to jump right to scan. And trust me, I am not saying that every pneumothorax needs to be diagnosed, and certainly not every pneumothorax needs a chest tube. There's actually a lot of debate out there as to when and how to put in, you know, when we should be putting in chest tubes. But when you really want to know, um, there are a couple things you can do. The first is you can send them over for an expiratory view. Remember I said we normally take chest x-rays in full inspiration? You can send them over for an expiratory view, which will sort of smush his lungs down and it will widen out that space where the pneumothorax is, and sometimes will make it more obvious. And when we zoom in here, you can sort of see there's a reflection coming across, a pleural reflection there. Another trick that you can do is you can invert the image. So in the old days of plain film, every workstation had what they call a hot lamp. And basically, it was like a little spotlight. And what you would do is you would take the film and backlight it with that hot lamp and look around the periphery. And what the hot lamp would do it would make lines appear black, darker. And so it would emphasize the lung markings. So you could see, are there lung markings up in the apex or not? It would also emphasize the pleural reflection and make it clear. Now with digital radiography, most PAC stations have the ability to invert the image. It usually looks like you know, a circle half black, half white. Click on that, and it will flip your colors. And it will sometimes make lung markings more obvious to see. It's also a neat trick um, in uh, orthopedic radiology when you have like an old osteoporotic person and you're questioning whether they have a subtle fracture, try inverting the image and it will sometimes make the fracture line jump out at you a little easier. So, um, How good is chest x-ray? It's sort of our, our initial go-to at most places. Well, it turns out it's not great. So the best chest x-ray is actually a lateral decubitus with 88% sensitivity. Uh, I was putting together a chest x-ray talk for ASAP years ago, and I went to our chest radiographer, radiologists and asked them if they had any lateral D-cubes, and they laughed at me. because like, nobody does this, especially in like an unstable trauma patient. The next best in our upright chest x-ray, only about 59% sensitive, which is really pretty terrible in terms of diagnostics. And then for a supine x-ray, which is sort of our initial screen in our trauma patients, it's only 37% sensitive. All right, so pretty terrible. So a negative chest x-ray doesn't rule anything out. Now, if you really need to know the answer, the gold standard is really CT. Um, and by really needing to know the answer, I mean if they're going to be transported out of your hospital for a long period of time, or you know, certainly if they're going by air, you kind of want to know if there's a pneumothorax there. If they're going to be under anesthesia for hours and hours, you kind of want to know. But not every pneumothorax needs to be diagnosed necessarily. This patient came in as a level A activation to our trauma center, pretty banged up. Here was his initial trauma screening x-ray, and you can see it's a supine trauma patient. And when we look at it, it looks abnormal. And as we run through our system, when we get to diaphragm, his left hemidiaphragm is really non-existent. It's really deep and indistinct and plunging and hazy. And this is classic for what we call a deep sulcus sign. And the reason why we're seeing this, this is a pneumothorax. The reason why we're seeing this is, again, the technique. This patient is supine. So in an upright patient, air rises up to the apex, and that's why we look up in the apex for a pneumothorax in an upright patient. But in a supine patient, it raises, rises anteriorly, 
And the effect that that has is it tends to push down on the diaphragm, and it makes it sort of hazy and plunging and indistinct. So positioning really changes the appearance of some common uh, pathology that we would see on plain film. The other thing that concerns me on this patient is, is I already checked and saw he's not really rotated, but when I look at his lungs, his left lung is definitely hazier than the right. So I am actually very worried that in this patient, this is actually a hemopneumothorax with a layering hemo, uh, hemothorax coming up. All right. So again, apically in an upright patient, anteriorly in a supine patient. This gentleman comes in. He had sudden onset sharp pleuritic chest pain. It's about 2.30 on a Friday night. And here's his initial x-ray. And as we go through our system, we look at his airway, and right away up in the neck, I start to see something a little funny. See these sort of dark lucencies, linear lucencies up there? Those aren't normal. And then as we go through, and I look at his cardiomediastinum, I start to see some other stuff. I see a line here that catches my eye. This is pneumomediastinum, all right? All these linear op dark opacities up in his neck, that's all sub-Q air and his heart is sort of outlined in the air now. And again, a study in contrast. This patient has a really uh, specific finding for pneumomediastinum in addition to what we're seeing up in his neck. If you look at his heart and where it meets the diaphragm, you're actually able to trace that diaphragm all the way across. And they call that the continuous diaphragm sign. Normally, you shouldn't be able to do that because normally you have dense heart adhered to dense left hemidiaphragm anteriorly. So you shouldn't be able to see a border there. But now what we have is dense heart with air in between it and the diaphragm, and so we're able to trace it all the way across. And that's very specific for pneumomediastinum. The only other thing that really causes this is pneumopericardium, which is very rare, thankfully. So when you see this, it's very specific for, some, for pneumomediastinum. When we look at the lateral, the corollary to it is there. Now we're able to trace that left hemidiaphragm all the way across, whereas normally we would lose it where it joins the heart. Does everyone see that? So again, pneumomediastinum. So when you see this, the next question you want to ask is, well, what was the patient doing when this came on? And it turns out that this gentleman was smoking crack. Um, you get pneumomediastinum when you have a forced exhalation against the closed glottis, and very commonly associated with inhalational drug use about 40% of the time. You also see it in athletes, particularly weightlifters, when they're straining to lift. You'll see it in asthmatics. You'll see it in cases of severe coughing. There have been case reports of this with pertussis, so you'll definitely see it there. If, however, you see it with any hint in the history of vomiting, and certainly if you see pneumomediastinum with a pleural effusion, you have to assume it's Borhoff's until proven otherwise, or nowadays effort-related esophageal rupture is the term. But any whiff of vomiting in the history or any pleural effusion, you need to rule this out, because if you don't, mediastinitis is pretty much fatal if it's untreated. So any hint of vomiting, you gotta go chase that down. And it can be subtle. So this guy came in, he had some retching and then developed pretty severe chest pain after that. Here's his x-ray, and as I look at it, as I'm doing my system, when I look at the cardiomediastinum, I see these weird little bubbles down here at the base. And as I look and try and trace out his diaphragm, I'm not able to see his left hemidiaphragm behind the heart at all. So that tells me that something is sitting back there. And in this case, it was a pleural effusion. Not super impressive radiographically, but then when you look at his CAT scan, you'll see air nicely outlining his esophagus there and a nice left pleural effusion. All right, so if we didn't treat this, this guy would have died. All right? As it is, the prognosis is still fairly you know, serious. This is a bad disease. And so again, pneumomediastinum with any hint of vomiting, you gotta chase this down. If they can give you a pretty clear history that they were smoking dope and suddenly had this, it's a sterile process and most of them do just fine. So I don't necessarily think you need to chase down esophageal rupture in all of these patients. But any vomiting, it's sort of incumbent on you to do that. All right, so this was a whirlwind overview of chest x-rays. Um, we're gonna touch on a few more uh, at the end of the day in our mystery cases. But in summary, 
look for adequacy, assess for penetration, rotation, inspiration, and completeness. Remember to be systematic. Start practicing looking at the ABCs, do it the same way every time. And the more you do it, the more intuitive it becomes and you don't even have to think about it. Remember that the film technique can have huge implications on how we interpret this. Was the patient upright or supine? It's gonna change where we look for pneumothoraces, it's gonna change how hemothorax looks. So really keep the positioning in mind when you look at these. Look for those silhouette signs and retrocardiac uh, opacities, the spine sign, respect it. Know that pulmonary edema has a spectrum of findings. Look for those curly B lines. The more you look, the more you start to see them. And remember that supine chest x-ray in particular has a very poor sensitivity for pneumothorax, so it doesn't rule anything out. And it's gonna appear differently than it would on an upright patient. And then any case of pneumomediastinum, again, with vomiting, Borhoff's until proven otherwise. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Maureen. I'm going to hold questions. I'll be in the back uh, later in the day for questions if you guys have any. So thank you. <laughs>